Joining me or rejoining me is CNBC Markets commentator Michael Santoli. Also, Tony Dwyer, who's chief market strategist at Canaccord Genuity, and David Bonson, who's founder and CIO at High Towers Bonson Group. Welcome, everybody. All right, Michael, hey, what do you think? August ending on a high note. It is. You know, you had about a two or three week period where it looked like we were had the makings of a, of a more serious pullback. People thought it was time for one of those things. And yet that rotation where one group grabs a baton has happened again. Also, if you really go back and look at the big picture, What's really not to like? The economic data has firmed up a little bit. Uh, obviously, bond yields remain low, but the credit market is still uh, relatively solid. Uh, consumer confidence at a high. So it was just not enough bad news to pile on this market. I will say the banks couldn't get out of their own way today. It's not universally very positive, and we still have that overhead challenge uh, of the, the old uh, all-time highs above us. But it seems as if uh, the market got its legs back from under, back under it this week. Let's put those interest rates back up for a moment. It's been incredible how low. Low, David, the 10-year yield has been just about 2.1 percent. And granted, you had Hurricane Harvey, to, you had North Korea and some of the concerns there and, and a sort of a flight to safety. But then this morning, you have the core inflation number on that personal consumption, the one the Fed that looks at. It barely up was up a tenth on the month. It's up just 1.4 percent on the year. And here's the fascinating thing. You have an economy that's adding jobs at a record-breaking pace. You have no inflation in sight. I mean, are these potentially conditions for a bull market to keep on going? They're across the board conditions for a bull market to keep on going. Now, of course, a number of those conditions are susceptible to change quickly. But yes, low yields and low inflation with accelerating earnings, this is a, a perfect formula. But one thing that's really interesting, I was thinking as Michael was talking about oh, the sort of the no alternative trade that we saw maybe a year ago. Of course, we're piling into equities. There's nowhere else to go. But it's, it's not really that, like that right now. Um, the reality is that Japanese markets, European markets, emerging markets look quite strong. Yeah. Yet the U.S. equity market still continues to find some spot of attractive. And Tony, you guys were smart enough to pick up Brian Reynolds. I mean, if any, you know, he's been saying, I know you guys have been saying, look, there's reasons you can still be bullish on year, what is it, eight, nine of this bull mark. How much longer can this continue? I mean, all of the signs you would typically look for in terms of topping out and a recession looming, how many of them do you see on the horizon? Well, our new asset class strategist, Brian Reynolds, uh, a.k.a. my bond dude, we were lucky enough to get. And he comes <laughs> in from a little bit of a different angle. But listen, you know, cycles are not driven by time. They're driven by fundamentals, and the fundamentals are driven by Fed policy. So when you look at the real Fed funds rate, when you look at inflation over the course of the last seven years, it really hasn't changed. As a result of that, it's given the Fed the ability to really stimulate growth. Now, what we have now that's very different, I think, is starting to attract a little bit more attention. For the first time this cycle, Kelly, we actually have synchronized global growth, we have a weak U.S. dollar, and we have a reacceleration in the U.S. All of that leads to upside for equity prices. And, and I think it's important to kind of point out that equities really haven't done that much since June. So we've kind of been in the pullback camp as well. And the, and the average stock and the indices are pretty much flat during that period, setting up for the next leg higher again, which will be driven by better, better fundamentals. And, and one thing that Brian and I have kind of keyed off yeah. on, it's kind of interesting, don't you think, that the bond market believes the inflation numbers, but it doesn't believe the growth numbers. And I think where there's going to be a mistake uh, yeah. in I policy, mean, it's going to be that the growth numbers are being underestimated and they're more sustainable. Michael, here's the thing. I bet if it was the other way around, if they did if they did a 5% store comp and a 2% online, I don't think the market would have liked it so much. But when you can show you have that kind of organic yeah. online growth, I feel like that's what the market wants to Not see Not quite right as now. much. Now, of course, online, I'm sure it's a smaller base and all the rest For of you sure. can quibble. The market is trying to draw a distinction between Lulu and some of the others. First of all, not that many stores. They're not one of these huge legacy retailers that basically is burdened by a lot of unproductive stores. In fact, they have room to grow stores. Yes, they have a great online presence because the brand is distinctive, and they're not trying to sell basketball shoes up against Adidas the way Nike and Under Armour are. So all those things play in its favor. Also, the stock is down from about 62 and change in the past three weeks, so that's why you have balance potential. And here. kind of a weak performer year to date anyway. It's yeah, it's, like been, it's, it's well up, above its, its lows, but it's store. really been this kind of uh, battleground name. David, does this tell us that these brands as direct distributors are ultimately going to 
win in this retail environment? I mean, what would you do with Finish Line and Foot Locker and all the intermediaries now? Yeah, see, from our perspective, we don't like the sector, and so some of the individual names we that maybe do have some promise and do have some trading opportunity, we still wouldn't invest on it. But I will say, I think that's exactly right. The e-com presence you're talking about would cause one of these names, like Lulu today, to stick out. But also, another piece of Lulu that gets ignored a lot is that they don't have significant marketing advertising needs. It gives them a, a bigger advantage in, in yeah. margins. For us, though, we're dividend growth people. I don't expect to see these names paying, let alone growing dividends yeah, anytime you're soon. focused on, like, Blackstone over here. Yeah, really that's... boring names like that. <laughs> well, I don't know if boring, but... We're, we're free cash flow people, yeah. and that's a too cyclical for us. Fascinating in a different way. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There you exactly. go. Exactly. Yeah. Umbrella shares of 3%. Guys, anything you'd add there? Not too much, no. I mean, obviously, it's well off its highs. It kind of the fever broke after the whole GoPro uh, craze did cool off a little bit. Uh, but it seems like a decent quarter. The market's just not going to get uh, too overexcited about it. Yeah, and David as well. I mean, by the way, uh, see, when you're talking about some of the growth in this market, traditionally we would have in the past talked about a GoPro, talked about all these new exciting, you know, devices and things that were, you know, and then there's things. I mean, why? what's more interesting to you guys when it comes to opportunities? Well, um, Tony mentioned earlier that the index right now is sort of at the same level it was a couple of months ago. But it doesn't necessarily feel that way to a lot of investors. It feels better than that because the sector rotation Michael talked about earlier in the segment. The reality is, is that the market hasn't moved a lot in total, but certain pieces have sort of changed. So we've been talking about the selectivity need. It's really a good time for active managers, and it should be. Um, We've been saying it forever, but I think that this particular season, we're seeing it really play out. So in terms of where that opportunity has changed, yeah, it's not in the GoPros and Fang names necessarily. Um, I, I really do believe what we alluded to before. These dividend growth names provide two things that I think are really important. They are relatively more defensive names. So should we get some more North Korea, some more Fed tightening? Well, what happens if what Tony's talking about, all of a sudden, you know, the 10-year, the interest rates go up half a percent just because they're kind of coming in line with, with growth, for example. So if you look back to when the tenure did go up half a percent after the election in the end part of 2016. Well, but it was so low at that. I mean, it was like 1.6 at that point. No, it was 1.8. Yeah. And it, and so, yeah, you're right. It was a little bit lower than it is now. But it's already back to it's 2-1. To it's not too far away from right. it. But the, yeah. I, I think either way, um, the, the interest rate sensitivity to dividend growth names is very short-lived. Yeah, I'm not talking about REITs, utilities. I'm saying growers, I think, Tony, are more defensive. Tony, what would you say yeah. to that? Well, I, w I would agree. Listen, if, if we're right and the global and the data is right and the global economy is synchronized and actually still growing, which all the data suggests, and the U.S. is in a reacceleration and the dollar stays near where it is, you should have value outperform growth because the bond market, again, like we said before, is believing the inflation numbers and, and is low and not believing the growth numbers. If it starts to believe the growth numbers, you're going to get a curve flattener and you're going to get the more cyclical sectors to actually outperform. So we favor the financials. You know, on weakness, we favor the financials, the industrials, the industrial materials. And actually, if you get a tax cut, it's going to make that much yeah. better. Yeah, exactly. I know that's why we're so focused on it today. Final word from everybody. Michael, you first. Uh, we'll see if the uh, reflex bounce lasts. I think both those stocks, uh, Palo Alto and Nutanix, are in fighting these sort of downtrends. Uh, and, and we have had that net negative re reaction to even good earnings. So we'll see if it plays out. Yeah, Palo Alto up about 6 7% right now. David, what about you? Uh, well, in terms of just the overall end to this month, it's very interesting that now people are going to get statements and not just be happy with how equities kind of came off of what was a difficult period. Their bonds are going up. Their emerging markets are going up. You have this global reflation trade that is back on, and all, right. all asset classes are enjoying it. See the consumer confidence number. That was pretty hot. Tony, last word. I, I'm with Mike. I'm going to be a little bit skeptical until you – I'm not sure that you could just grip it and rip it here, but I think for next year we're going to have a lot more upside than people are looking for on the back of these better fundamental trends that we we're talking about. All right. Well, we haven't even gotten back to school yet. I'm not ready for 2018. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys for joining us. Tony Dwyer you, from Kelly. Canaccord Genuity. David Bonson from Hightower's Bonson Group. I know we have to look six months forward. It's just I'm not ready. Uh, members of the Marine Corps.